Welcome back. Today we're going to go deeper into our study of morphology. So we'll review the key points that we covered last time. Morphology is the study of the structure of words. And the main unit that we use when we study morphology is this thing called the morpheme. A morpheme is the smallest linguistic unit that conveys meaning regularly across words. So remember, this definition has two important parts. One important part is that it conveys meaning regularly. So that means you see the same morpheme in lots of different words, and each of those words has some common element of meaning corresponding to that morpheme. The second important part is that it's the smallest unit that has that property. So if you take a morpheme and you try to break it into parts, you get sort of meaningless strings of phonemes that don't mean anything. A word consists of one or more morphemes that are combined together in various ways. We've looked at affixation, and we're going to look at other ways of combining morphemes today. For example, a word like cats in English consists of two morphemes. You have the morpheme cat, which indicates uh, uh, the feline creature, and you have the morpheme plural s, which we have more to say about today, which indicates the plurality. In something like unclear, you have a morpheme un, which means not, and you have a morpheme clear, which means you can see through it. We saw that a morpheme, as it exists in a word, can be either a root or an affix. A root is the word to which a morpheme is added. An affix is the thing that is added. An affix is a prefix if it comes before the root, and it's a suffix if it comes after the root. So in cats, the plural s is a suffix. And in unclear, the negating element un is a prefix morpheme. We also saw that a morpheme can be free or bound. So for every morpheme, you should be asking, is it a root, a prefix, or a suffix? And is it free or bound? Free means that it can stand alone as a word. Bound means that it's a morpheme that can only appear when it is attached to other morphemes. So in the word cats, the root morpheme cat is free because the word cat can stand on its own, whereas the plural suffix s is not free, it's bound because it can't show up on its own. Similarly, an unclear, un is bound, clear is free. We saw that a morpheme can be added to a word to make a new word. And the lexical category of a word determines what morphemes can be added to it. Nouns are things that can take things like plural markers with an S and endings like like. Verbs can take tense-related morphology. Adjectives can take things like comparative morphology. Nouns, verbs, and adjectives, adverbs forming open categories, which means it's easy to form new words within that category. Prepositions, determiners, pronouns, conjunctions are closed categories in most languages, meaning that it is hard or impossible to form a new word within that category. So that's enough review. Now let's talk about something new. I'm going to talk about something called allomorphs. So you might be remembering phonology now. Remember in phonology, we had phonemes and allophones. Now in morphology, We've already talked about morphemes, so now we're going to talk about allomorphs. Let's take a close look at the English past tense marker in order to introduce this idea of allomorphs. So we're going to look at the past tense as it appears phonetically in English. Be careful not to be misled by the spelling. We're talking about English as a spoken language now, so we want to look at the actual phonetic forms used to express the past tense. So the verb climb, that's the present tense form, like I climb. The past tense is climbed, and I've indicated these words here phonetically. So we have climb. There are some details there, like the aspirated K and the unvoiced L. We've talked about that in phonology. The important thing here is that the phonetic form of the past tense suffix is D, climbed. That's a voiced stop, a voiced alveolar stop, D. You can feel that it's voiced. So it looks in this case like the past tense marker is actually the phoneme D. Maybe it's that, we'll see. Here's another example, the word work, and then the past tense of that is worked. 
Now we want to figure out phonetically, is that sound at the end voiced? Worked. It's not. Phonetically, it's a T at the end of that word, worked. You don't say worked, it's worked, right? So it looks like in the word work, the past tense is actually something different. It looks like it's actually a T, a different suffix maybe. And how about a word like blast? What's the past tense of blast? It's blasted. Notice that there is a vowel that is there between the T and the D, a schwa vowel. So the past tense marker there appears to be UD. UD. So we're in this situation where it looks like there's three different past tense morphemes in English. We have either a suffix D, which is voiced, a suffix T, which is unvoiced, or a suffix UD, which has this extra vowel in it. So what's going on here? Are there really three past tense markers in English, or are these somehow just three different forms of the same underlying thing? Remember in phonology, we saw that a single underlying phoneme can be expressed as very many different sounds, different allophones. So maybe something analogous is going on here. And in fact, phonological rules, phonological alternations play the pivotal role here. So we can see these three things as three forms of the same single underlying morpheme. And the reason they appear different, the reason they appear different when they're attached to those different words is simply because of phonological rules. In particular, English has a voicing assimilation rule. We didn't talk about this rule when we did phonology, but you could deduce that this rule exists by looking at some data for English. English has a voicing assimilation rule that looks like this. A voiced consonant is expressed as an unvoiced consonant when it appears after an unvoiced consonant. So this is an assimilation rule. A, co a voiced consonant coming after an unvoiced consonant acquires that unvoicedness from the thing that came before it. So when we have something like climb plus a phoneme D, what's going to come out is climbed, which will phonetically just be climbed. So there's no instances here where, so in this case, the D is coming after an M, an M is voiced, and so this voicing assimilation rule doesn't apply. It does apply to the L, so that's why the L gets unvoiced in climbed. When we take something like work, if we add a phoneme D at the end of it to get something which is phonemically work D with a D at the end, then if we just apply this voicing assimilation rule, what we get out is worked, which is exactly the phonetic form. So we see that underlyingly we have the same phoneme D, but phonetically we're getting different sounds, D and T. We also, in English, have a vowel insertion rule, an instance of epenthesis, which looks like this. In English, there's a general phonological rule which says that the phoneme nothing is expressed as the sound a, uh, the schwa, when it appears between two consonants of the same place and manner of articulation at the end of a word. It's a bit of a mouthful, but we can see what it does here. When we take a word like blast, and add a D at the end of it, just the phoneme D with no schwa vowel, what we get out is phonemically blasted, this sort of unpronounceable thing that has a cluster of three consonants at the end of it, which is not permitted in English phonotactics. In English phonotactics, a word cannot end with the phonemes S and then T and then D. It's in, uh, not pronounceable in English. So we apply this epenthesis rule and we get blasted, which is in fact the phonetic form of the past tense of the verb. So once we take these rules into account, we see that there is in fact only one past tense morpheme in English, and it's D, and it has three different phonetic forms, D, T, and UD, with the epithetic vowel. So when a morpheme has different phonetic forms, depending on the phonetic form of the root um, or due to phonological rules, then these forms are called allomorphs. So we say that the morpheme D, which means past tense, has three different allomorphs, D, T, and UD in English.
Another example, which we'll go through now, is plural marking in English. This is another case where you need to be careful not to be misled by the spelling. We're doing a phonemic analysis of English as a spoken language here. So let's get some data. We see the word dog, and we see the plural of the word, which is dogs, with a voiced Z sound at the end. So it looks like there the plural is marked by a Z at the end, a Z sound. We look at the word cat, the plural that is cats, that's unvoiced. So it looks like the plural is marked by an unvoiced S in cats. We look at face, and the plural that is faces, faces, two syllables. So it looks like the plural there is marked by us. We have a schwa vowel and then a voiced z. Okay, so this is really pretty similar to the past tense marker, right? We can see that there's these three different forms. We think these three different forms are probably just reflexes of the same underlying phoneme, the same underlying morpheme for plurality. What do you think that morpheme is? What is the underlying morpheme that is going to, being expressed as these three different allomorphs? Take a moment to think about it. Now, you might think it's S. In that case, you're being misled by the spelling. It's not S. It's actually Z. And how can you tell that it's Z? Well, in the case of faces, it ends with the Z sound. If it were underlyingly an S, then the plural of faces would be faces with an S, but it's not. So here we have three allomorphs of an underlying morpheme, which is in fact Z. We can see that by running a Z morpheme through these same phonological rules, which also applied to past tense marking. In fact, these phonological rules apply everywhere in the English language. So if we take dog and add Z to the end, we get dogs after running it through the rules. If we take cat and we add Z at the end, we get cat Z. We run that through the voicing assimilation rule and we get cats. We take face, we add a Z at the end, we get faces, we get this thing which violates English phonotactics, so we have to insert a vowel in there using our vowel insertion rule in order to make this thing pronounceable in English, and we get faces. So the underlying phoneme for plural marking in English is actually a Z. English has one plural morpheme Z, which appears as three different allomorphs, Z, S, and Us, with the epithetic vowel, depending on the phonological context of the end of the root that it's attached to. And the distribution of those allomorphs is determined by the same phonological rules that hold regularly throughout the entire language. So, if the form of a morpheme is determined by the phonological form of other morphemes in the word, then you have multiple allomorphs. You have things called allomorphs. This is analogous to phonemes and allophones from phonology. So remember in phonology we had phonemes and then we had allophones. Remember the distinction. A phoneme is something, uh, something which meaningfully contrasts with other phonemes to distinguish meanings. An allophone is something which does not contrast with another sound to distinguish meaning. Similarly, here we have morphemes and allomorphs. The connection is that in both cases, the exeme is the unit that matters for distinguishing meaning, whereas the allox, like the allophone or the allomorph, is a variant which does not express a difference in meaning, but is rather determined by the application of regular phonological rules. So that is enough about allomorphs and allomorphy. What I want to talk about now is morphological processes. So remember when we were talking about phonology, I went through the common kinds of phonological rules. This part is going to be analogous. I'm going to talk about the common kinds of morphological processes, which refers to ways that morphemes are transformed in order to express meaning in various ways. So a morphological process, which you could also call a morphological rule, is a change in the form of a word that corresponds to a regular change in the meaning of the word. Remember, when we're thinking about morphology, it's not just about form anymore. It's not just about sound. It's always about the pairing of form and meaning. So a morphological process is something where there's a regular change in form corresponds to a regular change in meaning. We're going to have to look at both sides. So 
That means we're going to talk about what kinds of meanings are expressed by morphological processes and what are the common kinds of morphological processes in terms of how they affect the form of a morpheme. So the major kinds of changes in form, we're going to start with form and then do meaning. Major kinds of changes in form are affixation, alternation, suppletion, reduplication, and compounding. You're going to see these kinds of morphological processes over and over again in languages. This is not to say that these are all the morphological processes. These are just the most common kinds. Let's start with affixation. This is in fact what we've been talking about the whole time. So affixation is a morphological process where the form of a word changes by adding another morpheme to it. You take one morpheme, you stick another morpheme next to it, that is affixation when you add a prefix or a suffix. So prefixes and suffixes, when you transform a word by adding a prefix or a suffix, then that is the morphological process of affixation. There's also things called infixes. So remember, a prefix goes before a root, a, a suffix goes after the root. An infix is actually a morpheme which sort of goes into the middle of the root. It actually intrudes inside the root, in, and it looks like this. So in Tagalog, which is a major language spoken in the Philippines, there are infixes which are like this. So here's some verbs. We have lakad, bili, and kuha, which mean walk, buy, and take. And now we'll look at the infinitive forms. So to walk, the infinitive is lumakad, and to buy, the infinitive is bumili, and to take is kumuha. What's going on is that to form the infinitive, you actually take this um thing and you insert it into the middle of the verb stem after the initial consonant. So lakad plus the infix um gives you lumakad. This is infixation. This is an example of what's called um, non-concatenative morphology, meaning that the, you're actually breaking up a morpheme when you add something into the middle of it. Now, affixation is the most common kind of morphological process, by far. And that's why we've been talking about it. It's also, in some sense, the most simple process. There's the second most common kind of morphological process, which does happen quite a bit in English, and other related languages is what's called alternation. So alternation is a morphological process where the form of a root changes in some regular way. So it's not that you're adding another morpheme, it's that you're taking a morpheme and you're changing its phonological form in some regular way. For example, in English we have the verb sing. Its present tense form is sing and its past tense form is sang. So we have an alternation where you form the past tense by taking the vowel e and turn it, turning it into a. We also see this in other forms. So we have the verb sink, and the past tense of that is sank. So that's what I mean when I say that the form of a root changes in some regular way. It's not just a one-off thing. You can find multiple forms where if you change the e to an a, you're also changing the present tense to the past tense. Also in something like stink. What's the past tense of stink? Stank. This e a alternation. There's a regular change in form, but we're not adding a morpheme, nor is this an infix, because I'm not like inserting an a into this. I'm actually like deleting the e and turning it into an a. So this is an alternation. Other examples? In English, we have words like tooth, the plural is teeth. We have words like goose, the plural is geese. So we have this oo e alternation that can express the plural in English. There's languages other than English which take this idea to an extreme. So for example, in Arabic, the way you form something like the plural of a word is always that you change the vowels in the same way that you do for a small set of words in English, in Arabic that's how it works, works for all of the words. So Arabic and Semitic languages in general, such as Hebrew, really take this alternation concept to a whole other level, and there's lots and lots of alternations used to express just about everything. In English, though, we have a few of these alternations, and it's mostly affixation. 
Remember, a small regular change to the root is called an alternation like this. We also have things called zero alternations. A zero alternation means that a gradation of meaning is expressed by no change in the root. So we have this word sheep in English, and the plural is sheep. And we call that a zero alternation. The idea is that we altered the morpheme by doing nothing to it. So that's why it's called zero alternation, because we didn't do anything. Now the next kind of morphological process is suppletion. Suppletion is a morphological process where a root is changed completely and unpredictably. So for example, in English, we have this verb go. The present tense is go, you say I go. But in the past tense, the form is went. And if you didn't know that the past tense of the verb go was went, there's no way you would guess it, right? There's no way that you would have guessed that went is the past tense of go unless you learned it. So this is suppletion. This means that the root is changed in a way which is complete and unpredictable. Another example would be in the English pronoun system. So we have this word I, which means the first person singular subject pronoun. So you say I walk meaning it's first person, so it's me, singular, it's only me, and um, it's a subject, so you use this as the subject of a verb. Then the plural of that is we. And if you didn't know that the plural pronoun was we, there's no way you would have guessed it. So when we go from the singular I to the plural we, there's an unpredictable change, and so that's suppletion. Also, when you go from the subject pronoun I to the object pronoun me, like when I say, you saw me, then that is again a change in meaning which corresponds to a change in form which is totally unpredictable. If you didn't know the object form was me, there's no way you would have guessed it. The form went has nothing to do with the form go. In fact, went used to be the past tense of another verb, wend, and somehow that became the past tense of the verb go. It's important to contrast suppletion with alternation. Remember, alternation involves a small and a regular change to a root. Suppletion involves a complete, unpredictable change to a root. So remember, when we were talking about alternation, we saw many examples, like sing, sang, stink, stank. But with go, went, you can't find any other examples of that. It's not even clear what it would mean to find other examples of that, because it's a complete, unpredictable change. So that is suppletion. The next major kind of morphological process, something we don't really have in English, is reduplication. Reduplication is a morphological process where a morpheme is repeated. So here's what that looks like. In Indonesian, the word for house is rumah, the word for mother is ibu, the word for fly is lalat, and let's look at the plurals. So the way you say houses, the plural, is rumah rumah, the way you say mothers is ibu-ibu. The way you say flies is la 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 la. So you form the plural by just doubling up the singular morpheme. That's reduplication. And there are many languages where this is what we call a productive process, where you can take any word and make it into a plural version of that word by doubling it. The final morphological process that I want to talk about is compounding. So compounding is a morphological process where independent words are combined together. So this means it might be hard to identify which one is the root. For example, in English, we have something like this, text plus book is textbook. You wouldn't really say text is a prefix, right? You wouldn't really say book is a suffix there. It's more like you had two independent words that got glommed together into one, and it's a compound. Something like air conditioner is air plus conditioner. Conditioner itself has many morphemes in it. There's condition and then er. But air conditioner comes from the compounding of air plus conditioner. This idea of compounding is prevalent in English, and it's taken to an extreme in the German language, where you have examples that look like this. This is a word consisting of four words compounded together, Park, Zeit, Überschreitung. And let's look at each part of that, see what they mean. You end up with a long compound word. It means exceeding the amount of time one is allowed to park. 
a compound word. And the parts are actually not so hard to understand. So schreitung means stepping. Uba means over. So überschreitung, those last two, means overstepping. So it's a kind of transgression. The other ones are pak, which means parking. Zeit, which means time. So if I were to translate that word morpheme by morpheme into English, I would end up with park time overstepping. Parkzeitüberschreitung, which means overstepping the amount of time you're allowed to park. So it's quite reasonable. And the German language is full of these very expressive compounds like this. So those are the major kinds of morphological process in terms of the form, the ways that the forms change. We have act fixation, alternation, suppletion, reduplication, compounding. But remember, in morphology, there's always form and meaning. There's always two sides. So now we need to look at the ways in which morphological processes express gradations in meaning which means we're going to look at the functions of morphological process. The function of a morphological process refers to how does the meaning change when the form changes in some certain way. We've looked at the major kinds of alternation and what major kinds of changes in form. Now let's consider the major changes in meaning. What functions do morphological processes serve? So there's quite a few. One very common function of a morphological process is to take a word which is in one lexical category and transform it into another lexical category. So for example, we have a noun fury in English. Then we add a suffix to it, us, that's an affixation process. And the resulting word is now an adjective, furious. Now we have an adjective furious we can add a suffix like li to it. The function of the suffix li is to transform an adjective into an adverb, and we get furiously. Or we can add ness to it at the end. Ness is a suffix which has the function of transforming an adjective into a noun, and we get furiousness. So we sort of took a round trip there. Starting with a noun, we turned it into an adjective and then back into a noun using two different morphological processes. Another common function of morphological processes is to express a gradation of meaning. So not to transform one category into another, but just to express a sort of bit of gradation in the meaning. For example, if you have an adjective like green, you can add a suffix ish to it in English and get greenish, which means green, but maybe not as green as other things. You can take an adjective like clear and add a prefix to it un, to get unclear, you're flipping the meaning around there. You can take an adjective like flat, add an er suffix at the end, an affixation process, and you have flatter expressing that this is a comparative. So these are examples of morphological processes having the function of expressing a gradation in meaning. Another major kind of function for morphological processes is expressing grammatical categories. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So for example, this is things like a singular versus a plural noun or verb. For example, in English, we have singular nouns like cat. We add a suffix s, which is actually underlyingly a z, remember, phonemically, and we end up with cats. This is the grammatical category of singular versus plural, which is called number. So what's going on here is that we're using a suffix to express the grammatical category of number. The number of a noun is expressed here by the presence or absence of this suffix. Z is a morpheme that expresses plural number. Another major grammatical category, which is often expressed using morphological processes is tense. So tense indicates whether an event took place in the past or the present or the future. It applies to verbs usually. So for example, in English, we have a verb present tense like climb. You add a D to it at the end, past tense marker. That's a suffix, an affixation process, which has the function of expressing the past tense. The possible tenses, the common possible tenses, are past, present, and future indicating if this event is happening now or in the future or in the past. Now, an interesting subtlety here is that the 
Past tense in English is expressed using morphology, using a suffix, but the future tense in English is not expressed using a morphological process. Rather, what you say is something like, I will go, or I'm gonna go. You use a separate word before the main verb in order to indicate the future tense in English. So we don't use a morphological process to express the future tense in English, but it's different in other languages. So in other languages, the future tense is often expressed using a morphological process. For example, in Spanish, you have a verb like caer, which means to fall. Future tense of it is expressed by adding a suffix so that you get something like caerá, which means he will fall. So in Spanish, the future tense is expressed using a suffix. In English, the future tense is not expressed using a morphological process. Another major grammatical category expressed using morphology is aspect. This is another thing that goes on verbs, which tells you something like how an event is unfolding in time, not when it's happening, but how it's unfolding in time. For example, you have a verb like climb, you add ing to the end of it, expressing the progressive aspect, and now it's climbing, indicating an event which is continuously unfolding in time. The major possible aspects are progressive, that's like the ing in English, and the perfect aspect, which indicates events that are complete as of the present time. So for example, if I say he has climbed, that means the climbing is over, and that is a perfect aspect expressed in that case through the suffix D. Another major grammatical category is person. That is who is performing an event. So in English we have climb. We add a Z to it. That indicates that it is a third person singular present verb. The third person part of that is the person. That indicates that this is being done by not me, which would be first person, not you, which would be second person, but someone else, some he or she, some third party, which is the third person. So Z is a morpheme which in English simultaneously expresses the third person and the singular and the present tense of the verb. And so it's climbs. The possible persons are first person, that's like I, me, we, us, anything including the speaker. Second person, which is anything including the person being spoken to, which is you. Third person, which is anyone else. And this single morpheme Z in English simultaneously expresses number, person, and tense all in one morpheme, a suffix going on verbs. So we've talked about grammatical categories of number, person, tense, and aspect. There's also a number of grammatical categories that are not expressed really in any way in English. So other languages have other grammatical categories expressed through morphology, things like gender, things like possession, things like case. So for example, in some languages, like in many European languages, nouns are all either masculine or feminine or neuter. They have a gender feature, which is expressed through morphology. So for example, in Spanish, masculine nouns usually end in O, and feminine nouns usually end in A. You have a morphological process for expressing the gender of a noun. We don't have that in English, but that's still a grammatical feature, even though we don't have it in English. Of these, I'd like to point out case. Case is one which is maybe especially unusual for you as an English speaker, although you very well might speak a language which has case. So it's best to indicate what case is with an example. Case is kind of like the meaning of a preposition. So here's a word in Hungarian, hazonban. This means in my house. A single word means in my house. So it has three morphemes, has plus om plus bon. Has is the root, it means house. Om is a possessive, it's a first person singular possessive, so this means my. Hazom means my house, a morphological suffix indicating possession. And then bon means in, this is the case. That's the case marker. It's functioning kind of like the preposition in the English phrase, in my house. So we see here that in English, we have something which is expressed using multiple different words. In Hungarian, it's expressed using morphology all in one word, where you have the possession and the case indicated by affixes. 
So we have a root has, and then a possessive um, and then a case marking suffix bum. Now, the last thing I'd like to talk about is this notion of productivity. So you, morphological process can be what we call productive or unproductive. A productive process is something that can apply freely to any root within a lexical category. An unproductive process only applies to certain roots, a certain finite set of roots within a lexical category. So for example, the suffix ness in English, which is, it's a suffix, so it's affixation, that's on the form side, and on the meaning side, it has the function of transforming an adjective into a noun. The suffix ness is productive. Because you can take any adjective and add ness to it and get a noun. I can take angry and add ness to it and get angriness. I can take cool and add ness to it and get coolness. Maybe this isn't a word you've heard before, but you know what it means. It makes perfect sense, right? I could even make up a word. So I've here made up something called a nonce word. This is grew, gruish. This is just an adjective I made up, but I could teach you that this means something, right? I could tell you that gruish is you know, a certain property that nouns have in some language or something. And once you know the word gruish, then you can form the word gruishness. This is the strongest test for productivity. It shows that this suffix ness is highly productive. So as an example of an unproductive suffix, let's look at the th suffix in English. We have this in things like warmth. You take the adjective warm, you add th to it, and you get the noun warmth. Can we do this? We take the adjective cool, we add a th to it, we get coolth. No, this doesn't make sense. If you said this word, it's very unlikely that people understand what you mean, right? So I've indicated this here with this star on coolth. The star indicates a form that does not exist in a language. So star coolth means that's not actually part of the English language. So we see that th only attaches to a finite set of roots, it's not productive.